Okay, right hemisphere. Operation in unexplored territory. Negative emotion. Inhibition of behavior. That's this. That's anxiety. That's what happens when the Medusa looks at you. You turn to stone, right? That's the basilisk in Harry Potter. It freezes you. Why? You're moving forward according to a schema. If you're moving pro pro forward properly, you're getting to where you want to go and the schema is being validated simultaneously. I'm moving forward and the map is correct. Something happens that's unexpected. What should you do? Stop. What else are you going to do? You stop first, then the predator can't see you. Right? That's the freezing reaction of a prey animal. So it's, 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 it's built very, very deeply into you. Very, very old circuits do that. In fact, if it's a real orienting reflex to something that's anomalous, you'll go like this. And that's to stop the thing that will jump on your back from tearing out your throat. And that's really, really fast. It's almost as fast as spinal snake reflex circuitry. Extraordinarily fast. And th you know, that's conserved over an evolutionary span. That predator defense system is at the bottom of your cognitive apparatus. Everything's been built on that. Like, uh, it's a low resolution pattern. A higher resolution pattern that's the same pattern is built on top of that. Then a higher resolution pattern, that's the same pattern, is built on top of that, and so on. But that initial architecture is duplicated across the, the levels of differentiation of the nervous system. And that's partly why these symbols can be so archaic and still be accurate. It's still the way the world works. Negative emotion, inhibition of behavior, image processing. Right, because image, thing about images is they're fast. You know, a picture is worth a thousand words. Okay, you get the picture. You know, get the picture is actually something you say to someone if you say, do you understand? Right, to get the picture is very, very fast. So the right hemisphere manages that. Holistic thinking, that's that low resolution thinking that generalizes across instances. Pattern recognition, pattern generation, and gross motor action. Yeah, freeze and get the hell out of there. That's gross motor action. The right hemisphere is very good at that. That's why if you're right-handed, use your, if you're right-handed, you use your left hemisphere to manage the really fine motor details, right? You write with it. You write with it. And because that's very, very... If you're right-handed, you tend to use your left hand to open the top of jars. Right? You use your left hand. That's a gross motor action. I mean, sometimes people are more lateralized than that. But the left hemisphere is specialized for the fine-grained things that you know very well. That's, that's exactly it. Okay, the left hemisphere. Well, the left hemisphere, which is associated with positive emotion, by the way, that's specialized for operation in explored territory. So now what we might say is that you spend your whole life trying not to have your right hemisphere turn on. Because why would you want that? That's where the monsters pop up. So you stay in explored territory, but maybe you also tentatively expand its borders. And the left hemisphere seems to be involved in that too. So if you're curious about something, it's usually something, usually, something minor enough so that it won't blow your entire category structure if you explore it. Now sometimes you get unlucky, and you're like Eve in the Garden of Eden. You go have a little chat with this little snake that seems to be of no significance whatsoever, and it feeds you something, the apple, it feeds you something, and bang! Everything falls apart, right? You collapse, and you're out there in history, you're no longer in your old paradise. So, activation of behavior. Yeah, well that's because positive emotion is associated with movement forward. Like if you're where you want to be and things are going well, then your behavior should be activated so that you go and get things. Now, one of the negative consequences of that is that if you're really in a good mood, really happy, you're going to be impulsive and make mistakes. You know, because you hear these dough-headed, that's a very minor word, People who are always pushing happiness as the, as the key measure for, for successful existence. It's so ill-informed that it's embarrassing that that even happens. Positive emotion makes people impulsive. Maniacs, for example, which is really, if you, that's mania, right? Bipolar disorder. If you're manic, you're one happy person. Way too happy. Everything is great. Nothing but wonderful things that are beyond your imagination are going to happen to you. And they're going to happen fast. And so you're down to the mall to buy everything you can possibly get your hands on because you have a hundred uses for everything. And then a week later, you know, you crash into your depressive episode and you realize that 
you're $150,000 in debt and you've alienated everyone that you know. It's like that's untrammeled positive emotion. So how about no? You, the a peer index of positive emotion is no way of determining whether or not a system is working properly, even your own system. You need a balance between positive and negative emotions. Plus, positive emotions are absolutely exhausting. Because if you're in a manic episode, it's like, it's time to get everything good right now. Fine, but you won't sleep for a week, and then you die. Because you just burned yourself to a crisp. And so to be overwhelmingly enthusiastic about everything sounds like a real blast. And I've seen full-blown manics, and they're having plenty of fun, but it is not a pleasant thing to behold. They're just all over the place. And, you know, yeah. It's really not good. It's really not good. You need a balance between these two systems because the whole world isn't explored territory bursting with nothing but promise. That's not the world. The world is that in the bounded space a little bit with an absolute horror show going out ar around the periphery. And both of your both systems need to be active in order to keep you balanced. People do unfortunately sustain damage sometimes to the left prefrontal cortex responsible for positive emotion or the right prefrontal cortex responsible for negative emotion and if you sustain right hemisphere prefrontal damage it makes you inappropriately happy and impulsive and your and your life just goes you just spiral downhill because you make nothing but impulsive decisions and you know what the real world consequence of that is you know get drunk and be impulsive for one night you can learn what the bloody consequences of that are you try living like that for a month, independently of IQ. That's the other thing that's so interesting. You can blow out your left prefrontal cortex and not suffer much of a decrease, especially in crystallized intelligence. But the fact that you're running on nothing but, sorry, your right hemisphere, you're running on nothing but positive emotion is going to auger you right into the ground. And then if you're perhaps even more unlucky and you lose the left prefrontal cortex, then you're permanently depressed. Because there's nothing but the unexplored manifesting itself. We know that if you take depressive, depressed people and you do EEG analysis, that they have predominant lefting, predominant resting right hemisphere EEG activation. And so, why is this? Well, unknown territory, known territory. You think, well, is that real? Well, it's real enough. So that's how your brain evolved. That seems pretty damn real. So.